and the assistant estate warden for this year. Oops. Uh, yeah. Um, in our talk, we'll be taking you through the seasons and explaining some of the adventures uh, we get to experience. Uh, let's start with the calf team. So Aaron Sapsford is the ornithological warden, uh, and I'm his assistant. Uh, Dan Wollard is the assistant warden, and Molly is Dan's ward. Dan's assistant, is that sharing? So I think there's just a bit of a lag with us with our screen at the minute. Seems yeah, I, I can still see your first okay. slide, but I'm sure it'll. There, there we go. go. There, there we go. go. <laughs> <laughs> you can see the team. <laughs> yeah, Aaron Sapsford is the ornithological warden, and I'm his assistant. Uh, Dan Wollard is the estate warden, and Molly is Dan's assistant. And the calf season starts in early March and runs through to November. The actual arriving and leaving date is decided closer to the time due to the weather. The last two years of corona, coronavirus has affected the start date. Uh, but we were lucky enough to see some of the season out here. As ornithological wardens of a bird observatory, we witness and record migration throughout the year, uh, count breeding birds on the calf and submit the data into relevant organisations. There are many ways to do this. In this talk, I'll be taking you through some of the routines and challenges. In the daily log, sorry, the daily log is a big part of our routine. It begins as soon as we wake up, um, up to when we go to sleep. We record everything we see here and where we, we uh, experience it on the calf. Also, any interesting behavior or special moments, anything from a buzzard or a blackbird to a black rabbit or a cetaceans. The daily log feeds into a digital database held by Manx National Heritage and Manx Wildlife Trust which is also fed into NBNA, NBN Atlas and the relevant organisations we work with. For instance, the bird records and ringing data are submitted to Trektelen, which is fed into the BTO, the British Trust for on Ontology. We use many methods of catching birds safely. Uh, the first Heligoland trap, which is in the picture, was built in the 1960s. This is designed to funnel the birds down to one end out of the trap and into a collecting box. Uh, further traps were built in years to follow around the calf. Today, we have two fully functioning Heligoland traps in front of the observatory. Other methods we use to catch birds include mist nets, which is the bottom right picture, uh, different size spring traps, which is the top right, uh, walking traps, for example, the meadow pipit trap and the crow trap, and um, whoosh nets and hand nets. Bird ringing is one of the ways we monitor migration and help bird conservation. From adding a unique metal ring to the leg of the bird, we can see how far it travels and the time it takes. We also try to measure the age, the sex of the bird, the wing length, how healthy it is, as in how much fat and muscle it's carrying, if it's in malt and if it's breeding, and finally, uh, how much it weighs. With some species, uh, like the chuff in the picture, we had colour things to help identify birds much easier. Herring gulls, lesser blackback gulls, and great blackback gulls have colourings fitted here on the calf. They are very easy to read in the field, which means any member of the public can see them and report them. Uh, we get sightings from all over Europe. We joined the Manx Ringing Group colour scheme for Wheatier in 2014. As a result, we've received some good reciting data. They've travelled as far as Cornwall, Wales, and even Holland. A, a bird seen in Edinburgh was ringed four days earlier on the calf. Manx National Heritage were keen to extend research for the European Shag. Uh, this season, we have been granted permission from the BTO and DEFA to start a colouring scheme here on the calf. We can monitor the nest success rate easier with the colourings on the birds. We can also see if the birds come back in future years or see if they head elsewhere to breed.
spring migration starts before we arrive on the calf for the season. We try and get set up as quick as we can. To do this, we need to cut the vegetation along the net rides and set all the mist nets up ready. This task usually takes a few days to complete. We start seeing the birds from the first day. Uh, gold crests uh, arrive in large numbers from early March, followed by chiff chaff and warblers, uh, willow warblers. The cuckoo migrates from South Africa to their breeding grounds in Europe. The calf get around one or two a year through May and June. Uh, we actually had one this morning too. Uh, they have been recorded as early as April uh, and as late as August. We also get red, red start passing through the calf. Uh, back in the 70s and 80s, red start numbers were between 20 to 30 individuals per day, compared with one or two these days. The spotted flycatcher migrates through the calf in both spring and autumn. However, the biggest passage is in spring. The calf of man is one of the top five locations for passage of the spotted flycatcher. This spring we caught 47 and had observations of 65. It is a red listed bird, which means it's in decline. So any ringing data we collect is very valuable. Very low numbers of wind chat passed through the, uh, the car this year, which could be due to the weather. Um, either they held off in war warmer climates um, or they've taken a different passage to their breeding grounds. Uh, this picture was the only bird in the last two years which we caught um, and we were able to ring. One of the exciting aspects of the ringing is you never know what's going to be waiting for you in the nets. For instance, I was lucky enough to catch this wood chat shrike in the mist nets back in June. It had everybody excited. And last summer last year it gave me great excitement when finding this long-eared owl in the mist net. Stone chat breed on the calf in coastal habitats around the Isle of Man. The adults have a clever way of protecting their young. They get your attention and lead you away from the nest until they have, until you are clear, and then they return back to their young. Meadow pipits and northern wheat here nest in dry stone walls and on the ground here on the calf, and linnets nest in trees and in, also in the bracken. The European robin is resident on the calf year round. There is a big passage in early autumn of birds moving from Scandinavia to Britain. Some British birds will head south to France and Spain for the winter. Jibdale, which is one of the locations on the calf, is our, one of our seabird colonies. There are shag, herring gull, razorbill, fulmer, all nesting down there. It is accessible on foot, but with great care. We head down two to three times throughout the season to assess the breeding pairs. We locate and mark the nests um, for that season with soluble paint, which will disappear in time. We also count the stage of the nest and how, how many eggs are in it. Here is a picture of the shag's nest. You can clearly see how quickly the birds grow from hatching to a few days old. When the young are big enough, we re revisit each site and ring the young before they fledge the nest. While visiting the nest, we sometimes are able to catch the adults too. The two pictures on the left are, are adults and the far right picture is a youngster nearly ready to fledge. Because some of the colonies aren't easily accessible on foot, where we use other methods to collect the data. On this occasion, we use kayaks to access two shag and razorbill sites along the west coast of the calf. Razorbills are resident on the calf. Uh, they nest all around the coastline. The adults lay one egg a year, and within three weeks of, ha of hatching, the youngster will join the parents out at sea. The oldest known razorbill was at least 41 years old 
uh, when it was ringed as a nestling on Bazi, um, Bazi Island in Wales in 1968, and it was recited while breeding in 2009. They are very smart seabirds, um, more than you can say for the state that they leave us in. Prior to 1992, ida ducks were a rarity on the Isle of Man and the calf. Now we have approximately 60 to 70 pairs. Female eiders line their nests with soft feathers or down from their breasts. Uh, these feathers are so prized for stuffing pillows and were so prized for stuffing pillows and quilts that the eider nearly became extinct in the 19th century. Eider first bred on the calf before colonizing the Isle of Man. Uh, raven breed on the calf. Uh, young birds travel in flocks, but later mate for life. Uh, with each mated pair defending the territory. 2020 saw two pair of peregrines successfully fledge young. We were able to catch and ring one of the adults. Uh, when they enter a hunting dive called the stoop, they can reach up to 200 to 240 miles per hour. Uh, this makes them one of the fastest animals on the planet. On the calf, uh, we have nesting barn swallows. Um, with they nest in the outbuildings and up at Jane's house. And we actually ringed a brood of five in the outbuildings today. Oyster catchers breed all around the calf coast. They predominantly eat bivalves, including cockles and mussels. They don't eat oysters. <laughs> Um, they lay up to three eggs on shingle or rocky ground. Their incubation period is between 24 to 27 days. When the young are old enough, we round them up and we ring them. A magpie nest was found this year on the calf. It's the second successful year they have bred on the calf since 2007. How do crows nest on cliff edges and trees? Approximately 10 pairs nest on the calf each year. Yeah, most nests are on the cliff edges. Uh, use of climbing equipment and training is required to access the nest safely. The calf host, hosts approximately 80% of the island man's population for lesser black black gulls. 25% of herring gulls and 50% of great blackback gulls. Uh, the great blackback gull is the largest gull in the world. Uh, due to their size, they have few predators, uh, but may occasionally make a tasty snack for a, a white-tailed eagle, a, a shark, or an oyster, uh, an oyster, an orca out at sea. The calf of man is home to around 700 pairs of Manx Shearwater. They were nearly lost on the calf as a breeding population due to, the, due to land predators in the form of brown rats. Back in 2012, there were measures in place to eradicate them from the island, which Molly will cover later. Since then, the numbers are increasing yearly and we actively follow a Manx Shearwater recovery project. Uh, this monitors the amount of birds visiting the calf and the ones that stay to breed. One of the ways to get this data is to catch the shearwaters when they're on land. This is only possible in the middle of the night as they spend all day either out at sea or deep in their burrow. We collect the same biometrics as normal ringing. Through the breeding season, which starts at the end of May, we pick 100 random burrows around the calf. Uh, Manx Shearwater's calls are played down each numbered burrow to see if we get a response. This indicates whether the burrow is in use um, and also which 
sexes are occupying the burrow at that time, the call of the male is higher pitched than the, on the, that of a female. Here is a clip of me playing the call down the burrow. no verbal response from this bird but um, it came out to say hello anyway. A Max Shear was nested on Bardsey Island again in Wales in 2008. It was more than 50 years old and estimated, estimated to have flown about 5 million miles in its lifetime. Thanks to the generous donation from the Max Wildlife Park, we were able to invest in a thermal imaging camera uh, for this season. This allows us to locate wildlife through the night as well as during the day using their heat signature. We also use it to get a better idea of the numbers of Manx waters flying around at night and locating them on the ground to dazzle and catch. Here is a picture of a female Ida on and off her nest. We are able to see what's using the pond without causing any disturbance. We can also get an accurate count of storm petrols around the mist nets. Uh, using the thermal imaging camera, one of the projects for this year is to see whether the European storm petrol breed on the car. So uh, watch this space. The storm petrol is a fairly travelled and retrapped bird uh, from the Carver Man. It was recited wintering in Gambia. After reducing the population number of brown rats to zero, Manx Wildlife Trust started Project Puffin. We have two colonies of 50 plus decoy puffins. One is located by the upper lighthouse and the other at Keona Holby. In 2015, Manx Ornithological Society donated funds uh, for a solar powered sound system that plays puffing calls all through the day. These are, play, uh, are placed in the colonies by volunteers in the spring and removed in autumn ready for the following year. Last year, we were too late uh, heading to the car to deploy the puffins, but this year they're all out of their boxes. While carrying out the Manx Shearwater Borough accounts, I was very fortunate to witness the puffin on the screen, uh, collecting nesting material and heading down the rocks with it. We regularly see two pairs offshore um, around Kinalby. Hopefully in the future, uh, they will establish a new breeding colony back on the calf. As a precaution, we set up a perimeter around the potential breeding habitat to prevent any disturbance. Camera traps are located in both of the decoy colonies to see what uses the area. As you can see, the locked in sheep like to have a selfie or two. This is the group of puffins off just offshore by Gina Holly. Puffins are carnivorous. Uh, and live off small fish such as herring, hake and sand eels. Puffins are fab flyers, they're flapping their wings up to 400 times per minute and speeding through the air at 88 kilometres an hour. What's more, these brilliant birds are great swimmers too. Using their webbed feet as a rudder, puffins can dive down 60 metres underwater in search of their favourite fish. Through the breeding season, we do surveys survey work around the calf on land and also along the coastline by boat. We complete these three seabird surveys through the season and all the data is passed on, passed on to JNCC, which is a Joint Nature Conservation Committee. We count all the nest, nesting seabirds uh, that we can see by boat and also get a better idea of what's hanging around the calf. On our daily walks around the calf, 
we've seen this great skew on most days since we arrived in April. Um, it is thought to be the same individual that has returned to the calf for the summer every year since 2017. Rafts of razor bills congregate just offshore uh, from the breeding colonies. Uh, guillemots really know how to live, off, live on the edge, uh, quite literally. They nest tightly packed on steep ledges and cliffs around the coast. They may sound like a strange nesting, it might say, sound like a strange nesting spot, but it keeps them safe from predators. Thankfully, these birds aren't afraid of a little cliff diving. At three weeks old, the guillemot chicks jump off cliffs into the sea. Kittyweight cormorants and gannets don't breed on the calf, but some do roost over here uh, and feed offshore. And this year um, and this week, uh, we've proven that the black guillemots breed on the calf. We've had three young fledglings. About 100 pairs of fulmer breed on the calf, on the cliffs around the calf. Uh, fulmers are pelagic, meaning they live entirely at sea outside of their breeding months. The name fulmar comes from two Norse words, full meaning foul and ma, which means gull. This refers to their awful smelling stomach oil. <laughs> Although fulmers look like gulls, they're actually related to petrels. With the use of climbing equipment and training, we are able to reach some of the former nests uh, and ring, ring their young. The warblers are one of the uh, first species to start their migration in July slash August. Uh, they head south for the winter, to South Africa for the winter. September sees the arrival of robins and dunnocks moving south for winter. Um, yellow brow warblers are starting to be more regular migrants through the calf. A total of six birds were seen passing through the calf in 2020. Waders returned from their breeding grounds to spend the winter on the calf. Last year we saw 100 purple sandpipers roosting in the caves around the calf. September also sees the start of the finch movement. Thrushes and tits uh, start their migration in October. High numbers of red wing migrate through the calf. And the woodcock was an awesome autumn migrant last year. And they travel 870 miles between their breeding and wintering areas. The calf gets a couple passing through each year. Red-billed chuff are a very special bird on the calf. They're extremely vocal and aerobatic in flight. They are seen year round in the calf. They breed in old ruined buildings and in caves along the coastline. The calf has the highest density of red-billed chuff than anywhere, um, anywhere else. In winter, they socialize in big groups on the calf and on the Isle of Man. So downtime on the calf consists of chilling along the sunny coastline out of the wind. Strong windy days are good to spot passing migrants. And calm conditions are great for cetacean spotting. Harbour porpoise, which is in the picture, um, bottlenose dolphins, risser dolphins and minke whales are all spotted off the calf at different times of the season. All our sightings get entered onto Manx Whale and Dolphin Watch website. Um, we've actually had rissos this week and we've actually had them today and this afternoon, just off the south. Mm -hmm. You want to swap That's seats, it, yeah. maybe? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. That's my face. <laughs> I think I can read that from there. I just have to move that a little bit closer. Um, hello. Um, so I thought I would start by explaining a little bit about how we survive here. <laughs> um, as Rob touched on earlier, the calf is uninhabited over the harshest period of winter from November to March. Um, so when we arrive in March, setting up um, takes quite a long time and everything 
we use everything we live off and get stored away over winter. So we have to unpack everything. It takes quite a long time. Um, sorry. So um, the accommodation here, which is the observatory where everyone stays, has four bedrooms, a lounge, and two kitchens for the wardens, as well as a ringing office, ringing office uh, which is where we are now. Um, and it has one toilet, which is shared between all the wardens and all the guests throughout the whole season. So it can get a little bit packed in here. And um, we get our electricity from a diesel power generator, uh, which is on for approximately three to four hours of the day. And the rest of the time, our electricity comes from a battery bank that's filled up by the generator when it's on. Um, so we actually do have lighting and Wi-Fi and a fairly normal life for most of the time. And um, we have free fridges and freezers here and a good amount of food storage as well. Um, and our heating is in the form of a log burner, which um, is in the warden's lounge. Um, so that room can get pretty warm in winter, but unfortunately our bedrooms and the rest of the house stays pretty cold, especially in March when we first arrive and at the end of the season. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we try to get our weekly supplies shipped out uh, most, most weeks, um, but unfortunately it's very weather dependent. Um, and luckily ShopRite gets our personal orders for us, which is amazing. We send out a list of things that we want that we hope ShopRite sells and we get something similar or something to replace it most of the time, which is great. And um, we also get diesel and um, gas uh, sent out every other week or so to keep us topped up um, and our water is supplied by rainwater we catch all the rainwater off the buildings and keep it in a big tank and that's um that's most of our drinking water which is perfectly safe from the tap once it's been filtered and um, so that's our that's how we survive on the car most of the season okay next slide um so next i wanted to cover a little bit about our general estate work that i personally have gotten involved with so far um, many of our tasks are very manual la labour intensive, such as repairing tracks. Um, so this requires filling up potholes, repairing damage due to erosion from big storms over winter uh, when there's no one here to maintain it. Um, and most of the infrastructure is the same because it's um, exposed to the conditions over winter or it's just used by visitors during the season. Um, things just start to fall apart basically so our job is to maintain everything and keep it all running um, our highly labor intensive jobs are undertaken usually with assistance from amazing volunteers uh, we couldn't do it without them and they come out at the beginning of the season and the end of each season either side of the guest season when they can stay in the guest side um, we've also been maintaining tracks for day visitors recently um, so we have we have three main color marked paths that we use um, we have one that goes all the way along the west coast, which is the blue path. We have one that goes up to Jane's house, which is the green one. Um, and we have a black one that takes you through the center of the observatory and down to, to meet the blue path along the west coast. And so we paint these way markers every year just to keep them topped up and visible. We have one approximately every 100 meters along the track so people don't get lost. And um, this is particularly important in nesting season because we don't want anyone to accidentally stray into areas that could disturb nesting birds. Um, so another major job that we do throughout the year is bracken control. Unfortunately, bracken control is an absolutely massive project that's ongoing. Um, bracken is good in certain areas. Um, it's good for moths. It's food plant for a lot of moths. It provides shelter for certain ground nesting birds. Um, but it can be harmful to the overall diversity of plant life as it's extremely fast growing and very invasive. Um, it's also impacted the Manx shearwaters because it makes it more difficult for them to find their burrows and it makes it more difficult for us to find their burrows. Um, so we regularly flail inside the sections um, throughout the season. Um, this is again limited because of the nesting season. We don't want to be nesting anywhere that's going to disturb birds. And it usually takes about three years of consistent flailing or consistent bruising to have a real impact. So it's a really difficult thing to maintain. Um, Okay, next slide. Oh, so uh, one of the other major jobs that we undertake throughout the season, um, as Rob mentioned earlier, Manx Shearwater Recovery Project. Um, so this project was funded by Manx National Heritage and it began in 2019 with the aim to eradicate the long tails. Um, it was incredibly successful and involved placing poison blocks every 50 meters across the entire carp of man. So long tails can unfortunately swim for up to one mile in open water, which I think most people don't know. I certainly didn't know before I came here. Um, 
so their near eradication in 2012-2013 was amazing, but because they swim across the sound to the, to the, uh, from the Alaman to the Calf of Man, uh, we have to keep maintaining um, our monitoring so that we don't let the population get out of control again. Um, so we eradicate the brown rats because when they were first introduced to the carpet man, they absolutely decimated the Manx shearwater population due to their ground nesting life, due to the Manx shearwater's ground nesting lifestyle. And um, their chicks just don't stand a chance at all. They have no defense against rats, which will just come and eat the eggs and harm the chicks, attack the young. And there's a huge variety of ground nesting bird species. It's not just Manx shearwaters, it's puffins, it's wheat ear. Um, and they just wouldn't survive with a booming rat population here. Um, so we have to maintain this long-term um, population monitoring. Um, so when it first started in 2012, we had a bait tube, which is this black tube on the screen here, um, every 50 meters across the entire island. So you can imagine it was an absolutely massive job to monitor these. And we monitored each bait um, every single month. Um, at the minute, we only have one approximately every 100 meters. So it's slightly, slightly less baits. And we have 16 groups with about 25 groups. Uh, baits in each group. So there's not as many, but again, as I said, it takes up a considerable amount of our time. Um, so to keep track of these baits, we have um, GPS points logged for every single bait on the island, and they're split into groups, like I said. And um, so we go out and monitor one group at a time or two groups in a day, depending on how much time we have. Um, and we use the GPS so that we can, it can direct us, especially with the bracken has grown really tall uh, and we can, we struggle to find it. So we have um, these canes uh, with black flags at the top to point out each bait, which helps us locate them again. Um, and each tube has a wax block that's flavoured with either chocolate, almond or peanut butter. Um, and the flavour is just to attract the long tails. So when they nibble on the wax block, you can actually see the teeth marks and you use the teeth marks to identify what's been nibbling on it, whether it's a long tail or not. And um, so here on the top left, I have a lovely picture of a pygmy shrew, which are adorable. And thankfully they're the only things that have been nibbling on our wax blocks recently. Um, so we think we have a fairly healthy population of them. So it's interesting to monitor the other things that I've been eating. Um, the wax blocks. We also have slugs usually, it's just either slugs or pygmy shrews or it just gets a bit mouldy and they need to re be replaced. So it is worth checking them um, for them as well. Um, so we often get volunteers to come out and help us monitor the baits, which is an absolutely amazing help because <laughs> it takes up so much time. Um, but I personally do really enjoy doing the bait monitoring on the island. Um, you get to see so many places that you wouldn't have otherwise been able to see or even thought of going and you see different views of the calf and um, also um, whilst we were doing it this year uh, we came across several new ida nests that probably wouldn't have been spotted had we not been out and um, so we've just been logging them on the gps when we found them as well and we'd go out with rob and aaron and help them catch them later which has been a real treat so if anyone ever fancies coming out to the calf and doing any volunteering i highly recommend joining in with some of the bait monitoring Um, so another major part of the estate work uh, involves our guest season, which runs from June to September. So we house up to eight guests spread over three bedrooms and the accommodation is in the observatory with us, but it does have its own separate entrance and we try to keep the guests separate with their own space. They get their own kitchen and their own lounge. Um, so the guest season is very busy. It's been fully booked for this year, but if anyone fancies booking the car for your next holiday, despite the borders opening, uh, you can book it through Island Escapes for next year. So um, we get a wide range of people visiting the calf, sometimes family groups, sometimes couples, sometimes people interested in nature and sometimes people who just want to get away from it all, especially, like I said, um, with the borders having been shut. Um, and we get approximately 200 guests each year and we have around 3000 day visitors a year, which I thought was really interesting. Um, in terms of what we put in for guests, we pick up and drop off luggage, we give safety induction tours of the accommodation, uh, and we clean up the rooms and the communal areas between guests. We're also always happy to involve guests in the work that we do and show them what we're up to. It's really nice to have other people interested and um, enthusiastic. And it's also really nice to have some company, <laughs> to be honest. We do get sick of each other every now and again. <laughs> Um, so this year, before the guest season began, we actually had a series of adult education courses, uh, which is the first time we've run these. Um, so this ran from May to June, and it started with a dry stone walling course, which was led by Pat Griffiths and David Fisher, who are two dedicated long term volunteers who gave up the time to teach a wonderful trade to a variety of different people for different reasons. Um, and the wallers managed to repair 
and rebuild eight sections of walls around the upper and lower lighthouses, which absolutely transformed the scenery. They look great. Um, and of course, it made the area safer as well for the public. Um, and the second course that we housed was a photography course led by professional photographer Mike Radcliffe. And it was a highly popular course that he's run for several years. I think it's the only one that they've run before. Um, and he had so many opportunities for awesome wildlife shots here on the car that it was a great opportunity for people to come out and actually photograph it. Some people with some talent as well, <laughs> see what they had in store for that. Um, and Mike actually let me join in on the course. And I can say he was really, really great. We had loads of opportunities for grey seal photos. We did loads of sunset pictures at the lighthouse, which was stunning. Um, and there was lots of one-on-one -on -one time as well to get to grips with the technical side of things and the camera settings, which I appreciated. So I think it was really worthwhile investment. Um, so another successful Calf of Man event was the Manx Water Experience, which we ran. Uh, where guests were taken out by Aaron Sapsford, our bird warden, um, to dazzle Mike Shearwaters. And this night was an exceptional one. We caught 21 birds, including a control, uh, which means that it's come from somewhere else. And in this case, it came from Copeland and it had been ringed 19 years prior. So it's at least 19 years old. And I think it was an adult when it had been ringed. So that was really interesting. Um, the final course, um, Oops. Uh, sorry, the final course uh, was a beginner bird watching course with Tim Earl. Um, and the birders also, I think, had a fantastic time where they were able to improve their skills and identify seabirds, such as oyster catchers, as well as orcs and some common calf of man heathland birds, uh, like wheat ear and stone chat, which we have around, like I said, quite commonly. Um, Seeing birds caught in the hand as well uh, by Tim and Aaron and Rob seemed to be a fantastic way to learn the specific identification features uh, for challenging species like willow warbler um, and chiff chaffs and seeing them up close really helps get to grips of what the differences are, what to look out for in the field. And um, the birders also helped us complete one of our breeding seabird surveys from the boat where each person was given um, a species to count, which helped Rob and Aaron greatly. So thank you. Um, aside from the adult education courses, uh, we've had corporate volunteer groups come out and assist with big jobs, such as clearing out horsetail from the pond. Um, so the pond is a really important inland water source for birds, and it's the only large inland water body on the carp at all. And unfortunately, horsetail is a really invasive species that's highly prolific, and it takes over the pond when it's left uncut. And it causes it to turn stagnant and silt up over time, which is just no good at all. Um, and the works party included volunteers from JTC Accounting, and this was in mid-August of 2020, so after coronavirus, when the horsetail couldn't be cut in the early um, spring, as you can see in the top left, you could see no water at all, it was in absolute state. Um, so this was a lot of hard work, it required them to wear waders in hot sun, as well as cutting and shoveling sediment and horsetail across the bank, they worked really hard. Um, and they did an absolutely amazing job, but <laughs> I mean, it really was just scratching the surface. So it took poor Dan and Rob a further 50 hours of work um, with a little bit of help from the intermittent volunteers like myself in September. Um, but as you can see, it completely filled up again over winter and it's massively improved. It's, it's increased by about three quarters of the size it was. So they did a great job. Um, so another big project, but this was this year instead, this time, uh, was building the new bird hide for the pond. Um, now the water's clear again and we're starting to see birds utilise the water. Um, our fab volunteers, Mike Pryor and Paul Corrin, came over with a vision for this new hide. It's um, The hide allows us to observe wildlife without disturbing it, as well as allowing Rob and Aaron to ring separately. Initially, Rob was having to drive up and down to check the nets, so this allows him to be stationed here in the morning um, and ring birds solely from here. And um, also gives um, him somewhere to shelter and gives um, visitors somewhere to shelter, gives um, people the ability to sit in and watch the scenery um, with the occasional rain that we do get sometimes here on the car. Uh, whilst we were building the hide, um, there was about 15 swallows that kept coming through and diving and dipping across the water to drink. Um, it was quite stunning. So uh, Mike's decided to name the hide Swallows Retreat. I think we're getting a little plaque that we're going to put on there soon for him. Oh. Don't know why the names aren't on my um, slide, so sorry about that. 
Um, so aside from birds, we have a variety of wildlife dependent on the pond. So we've got a population of European eels, freshwater eels, which are the bottom middle, I would say eels, but you know they're eels. <laughs> um, so we spot them occasionally in the day, mostly at night though, they tend to hide themselves deep in the sediment during the day. But we've had two or three sightings this year just while, while wandering around and they get to pretty big sizes. And we also have a large damselfly population, blue tail damselflies mostly, which is the bottom left. Um, we've been counting approximately 100 every day by the pond when we go by. Um, although recently myself and Dan spotted a common blue damselfly, uh, which are similar to the blue tail, but the whole body is completely blue, they're very vibrant. Um, and this was, we think it's the first recording of this species with photographic evidence. So it's the first official recording. Um, and we, we've only been recorded a handful of times in the past. Uh, we also get common darters, um, which is the top left photograph, and we get migrant hawkers, which is the uh, right hand photograph. Um, so this image on the right of migrant hawker is actually quite an interesting one, as it was the first photograph of a juvenile migrant hawker that we have seen on the calf, um, and it's actually evidence that they were breeding here, uh, which we didn't know before. Um, we also get the occasional emperor dragonfly, as well as a variety of diving beetles and raft spiders, and we do actually have pond leeches, so have even more respect for the amazing volunteers that came out and went into the pond with the leeches and eels to uh, dig it out for us. Um, so the other more glamorous side, I'd say, of the state jobs <laughs> involves recording the wildlife for the nature reserve. Um, so we do, for example, a monthly grey seal survey where we cover half the island each um, we do the whole coastline recording the number of seals we spot around low tide when they're more likely to be hauled out um, and our highest ever count is 306 seals in 2016 and we think that's probably about average for the population there must be around 300 or so um, and the majority of these animals are spotted hauled out um, on the north sides at the Kletz and cow harbour um, and the south side it's south harbour and the puddles they're the best sites to go and see seals if you're around the calf and you wanted to see some Um, so every year for the past 11 years, the Mags Wildlife Trust has run a dedicated grey seal pupping survey here on the calf, where two volunteers are recruited to join the team for September to November to count the number of grey seal pups. Um, this was actually my job last year, it was my first introduction to the calf, um, so I did this along with Brishi Harkin, and it was my, like I said, it was my first introduction to the calf of man, it was an absolutely fantastic way to experience calf life for the first time. We spent every day surveying either the north or the south side of the island. Um, for seals and we got to make notes of all the birds we saw as well along the way to help out with the log um, and the largest grey seal pupping site on the calf is the largest grey seal pupping site on uh, the whole of the Isle of Man so it's a really important one um, to dedicate time to and actually survey. So um, last year we had a total of 62 pups um, and we also took photographs of the mothers as we went by um, because they have markings on their fur and we're actually able to identify individuals from the markings on their fur. We have a catalogue that spans from the beginning of the survey with every mother that was spotted and photographed and we can see how many times they've put there. Um, and this happens quite a lot. We, we get ones that are sight faithful and they come back. Like there's one um, who pupped last year in South Harbour called Mole who was pupped there every year since the SEAL survey began and she's really loyal. So that's a nice thing that we can, we can look out for. One of the highlights for the seal survey for me was watching one of the mothers give birth to a pup and we named the pup Vita um, and we're the first seal surveyors ever to actually witness a birth which is really cool um, and Vita was also the very last pup to leave um, and she left she took her first swim the day that we left it's the first time we watched her into the water so that was quite poignant as we were leaving and she was as well so that was nice. I also have this adorable video for you one of our pups this is one of the gorgeous pups from last year as you can see she's quite clean and she's got quite a lot of baggy skin still so she's probably about a week old um, and they move around an awful lot which is a nightmare keep track of who is who and um, so we often have to wait for hours until their mum came back for a feed so we could identify which pup was with which adult um, and they're also really vocal but they have really low voices and they're really screechy kind of sounds what i thought was like a teenage boy shouting mum it's a lot deeper than you'd expect, but they were absolutely charming. Um, so this is actually a common seal or a harbour seal. Um, they're the only other species of seal that we have in the UK. 
Um, we have very few around the Alaman, we have very few on the calf. Um, we've had a maximum count of eight um, in one survey. So we don't actually survey them exclusively like we do with gray seals. Uh, they also have their pups much earlier in the year than gray seals. So they have them about July, August, whereas gray seals, like I said, were September to November. And their, um, their pups are a lot darker. They don't have the same white fluffy coat. They're born as basically mini adults. So they're actually a lot more, more difficult to spot. Unfortunately, pups have been seen around the Isle of Man, but none of them have actually been known to survive, which is quite a sad fact. Um, but you can differentiate. They're quite similar to grey seals when you first look at them, but they can differentiate between them um, from their side profile. So harbour seals have a very distinct nose. They're very prominent. Um, dip between the forehead and their nose and they have quite big foreheads as gray seals have very sloped face with no defined nose ridge and they have short foreheads um, harbor seals also have a very cute love heart shaped nose as you can kind of see in the photo whereas gray seals have parallel nostrils so if you're out around the car and you happen to see a, a seal with a big lumpy forehead and an adorable love heart nose it's probably actually a harbor seal so let us know um, so another area of wildlife that we monitor is moths. Moths are vital nocturnal pollinators. They have really fuzzy thorax, which picks up pollen whenever they land on flowers to feed and instantly pollinates it when they go from one to another. Um, certain species of plants have actually evolved to produce stronger scents at night to attract moths to pollinate them. Um, and certain species of flowers are thought to have only been pollinated ever by moths. So they're quite important. And they also tell us information about the health of the general ecosystem as their success is directly related to the success of their food plants. And the abundance and the success of their food plants throughout spring, mostly. Um, and the calf has a huge diversity of moths and we've identified 420 different species of moths, which is massive considering we have a relatively low diversity of food plants, I would say. Um, one way we survey for moths is with light traps, such as the one here on the slide. Um, moths are attracted to the light, which dazzles them, and then they fly downwards away from the light. They're funneled by those two sheets of plastic you can see in the top, and we fill the bottom with egg cartons so that they go to shade and they hide in and amongst the egg cartons. And so just before daylight, we go out and cover the moth trap and bring it in so that we can go through it in a more convenient time because it's usually about 4 a.m. that we have to go out and cover it. Um, and we also like to involve guests or anyone around who's interested in the moth trap. People tend to find them quite, um, quite exciting. Um, we have, so we have one um, very powerful one, which is a mercury vapor trap, but it has to be run off the mains. So we can't put it out very far. We usually put it um, by the observatory in the plantation. Um, and we have a portable black light trap, which is the one in the photo, which runs off a car battery that we've taken across the island, loads of different places to survey all the different habitats. We put out the light traps whenever the weather is suitable. So the moth traps require dark, cloudy skies, uh, very warm weather, if possible, uh, little wind and high moisture content in the air. A small amount of rain does them quite good as well, actually. Um, so in peak season, we catch around 400 individuals. Um, so you can imagine it actually takes quite a lot of time to go through each trap. Um, so anything that we're struggling to identify or we don't recognize, we catch in plastic pots and then we put them in the fridge for a short period of time so they become less active. It doesn't do them any harm, but it means they're less likely to fly off and we can take a photograph of them. Um, and we send all of our records of moths to our county recorder, Ian Scott. Um, and anything we can't identify, he also um, identifies them for us, helps us out with them. And it's usually good for that. Um, especially micro moths, they're very difficult to identify. Some of them actually require dissection. You have to dissect their genitals to know which certain species it is. We don't have, um, have the ability to do that here, unfortunately. So um, as I mentioned, micro moths. So the two photos here, which unfortunately the names have disappeared, I'm afraid. And one of them is a scientific name that I can't remember, so I apologize. Um, but the micro moth is on the bottom. As you can see, it's so much smaller. That's why it's called micro. Um, so that moths in general are split into macro moths and micro moths. And um, so the one on the top left, I think is a wood moth um, and that tiger wood moth, um, and that's a macro moth. So it's a lot bigger and they're a lot easier to identify generally. Um, so, um, 
we tend to go through um, the egg boxes from the, we remove the egg boxes from the trap, which makes it a lot easier to go through as well. And we could do one at a time. And then once we've got a photograph or we've potted what we want and recorded what we want, um, we tap out the egg trays into the vegetation and give them a bit of cover so birds don't go mad at them. Um, so here are some of our common moth species that we catch. And they, as you can see, they come in a huge variety of colors, shapes, and sizes. And these are all obviously macro moths. We tend to get a lot more macro moths in the light traps. Um, and they come in a huge variety of patterns. Um, some of them, for example, angle shades at the bottom. Thank goodness these names have come up. That's helpful. There's so many. Um, they tend to try and replicate leaf litter. So some of them use their uh, patterns to camouflage, similar with map wing swift. That's quite a well camouflaged moth. Um, and others are just really vibrant and unique, like white ermine. I think they're more designed to be bold and attract mates rather than hide from predators. Um, so some of them have also have really bizarre names. So we've got moths called Uncertain. And there's also one called Cetaceous Hebrew Character, Old Lady and Dingy Footman. So that's quite a weird thing that comes with moths. Um, the very common ones we get, um, especially this year, are broom and not grass, true lovers, lovers not, we get a lot of. Um, and we don't get as many of um, map wing swift or pebble prominent, but we have enough to, to call them common, really. Um, one question we often get asked when going through the moth trap is how long moths live for, but this really varies between species. Some of them live for a couple of weeks just to mate and then lay eggs before they die. And some live for over a year as moths and um, they overwinter. So here are some of the moth highlights that we've had. Um, highlights of rarities on the calf, for example, small marbled um, and older are both first records for the calf, which means that only one of each has ever been recorded here in calf history. Chinese character is the second record from back in 2019 um, and Vestal Moth, that was one that I spotted when we went to Kids Land, um, which was the fifth record for the calf. Um, both Chinese character and Vestal Moths are actually migrants from Northern Africa and Southern Europe, so they've travelled a really long way for such small insects, it's really impressive. Um, Shuttle-shaped dart and common wave are this year's highlights so far. Um, with shuttle shaped dart being the second record for the calf. Um, and then the next week, I think we put the trap out again and we caught another one, whether it's the same one or not, I don't know, but that's the third ever record for the calf. Uh, and common wave with the fourth ever record for the calf. Um, and that was a couple of weeks ago. Um, unfortunately this year so far has been really slow for moths. Um, and I'm not sure whether that's just the weather and hopefully things will pick up soon. But I mean, we've been averaging about 20 moths a night um, which compared to 400, as I say, in previous years is absolutely abysmal. Um, so fingers crossed things will pick up soon. Um, so this is quite an interesting species. Um, it's called the gray. It's a really coastal moth um, and its food plant is sea campion, hence why it's coastal. Um, it's also a red listed species. It's incredibly rare and, th and threatened. Um, and as you can see from the distribution map, they're only really found in Northern Scotland and they're also found in Southern Ireland um, and the Isle of Man is a really good spot for them as well. Um, um, so it tends to be a bit of a hotspot, the calf man. And there was only um, one record of the gray last year on the Isle of Man where there was um, 23 is the maximum count we've had on the calf. So the calf is a really important area for them. Um, so they're actually supposed to only be found about 50 metres inland of the strand line, but we've been catching them here at the observatory in the plantation, which is a lot further, further than 50 metres, which is interesting, and very little is known about this uh, moth. Um, and Aaron talked um, to me about one time when he was out dazzling a couple of years ago, and he said there must have been about 100 flying past, and because they didn't have the light trap, portable light trap back then, they, they just couldn't survey them. And um, so it'll be really interesting to use the portable trap we have this year and see which areas have more um, and how they're doing in more coastal sites, considering we're getting them so inland, there must be quite, um, quite a lot of them around. So um, another way that we trap moths is with pheromone traps. 
So um, you can see from the photo on the right, most of uh, moths have these amazingly powerful antenna. They're really long um, and in males, they're usually really furry. And that's one way that you can differentiate between males and females is the males have really hairy antenna. Um, but this moth is called a thrift clear wing. Um, and it doesn't have particularly hairy antenna apart from towards the ends, but they do have quite powerful um, antenna to um, detect female pheromones. So you can actually synthetically produce the female's pheromones for certain species like thrift clearwing. Um, and we've, we bought some this year um, and you put it in this bucket trap on the left here. And within minutes you get, um, we had 18 moths we surveyed this year come to the trap. As you can see from their wings, their clear wings, uh, they look quite a lot like flies um, and you probably wouldn't really notice them so much if you were just out in the field and they fly incredibly fast. So without a pheromone trap, we really would have no idea what their population is like. And we also don't really have any idea of whether they've used uh, pheromone traps in the past. Um, so it'd be really interesting from now on if we keep using it to see what their population's like. Because um, we have huge carpets of, of thrift, of sea thrift, on Baru and Kaga and around Rarik. Um, so they're the three sites that we've been surveying. It'd be interesting to see um, how their population um, changes in the, in the coming years. Oh, we've got um, a video there of one flying past. You see they fly really quickly. You wouldn't think anything of them um, without taking a photo or trapping them. And so these are day flying moths and they look really similar to butterflies. Um, but as you can see, most of them hold their wings further back when resting, which is a telltale sign that it's a moth. And the first one up at the top left is called a pus moth. And they're really large and fuzzy um, and they're cat-like furs, why they're called pus moths. And they tend to be sat on branches during the day and they climb up onto twigs or fence posts, or we've even seen them on blades of grass. And we found this one just outside the observatory on the washing line post. Um, it was huge and um, you sometimes get them on the boardwalks, especially around Jane's. So if you're ever up there, have a little look out for these huge moths. Um, so this one was um, a really fresh one that we found um, and it actually laid 24 eggs when we caught it. it. Squirted out this hideous neon pink liquid and 24 eggs, um, which we've kept. So fingers crossed they might hatch out and we'll have lots of lovely little pus moths. Um, so the next one along is a tiger moth, garden tiger moth. They're really stunning, very common moths that you might have seen. They only come out July, August, so we haven't had any yet. Um, but we have seen their caterpillars around the place, which are orange and black and really hairy, and they're called hairy bears, which are quite cool. Um, the one on the top right is a common heath moth, um, and they haven't been recorded that much here. But this year we've had absolutely loads. They've been everywhere, so they've had a really good year this year. Um, and they, they're really variable. Sometimes you get really yellowy ones. Um, so they can be kind of tricky to ID, but because we've had so many, I feel like we're quite good at that now, actually. Um, the bottom left is cinnabar moth. They're quite common. You get them around the calf. Um, and the bottom middle is a clouded border moth, which are quite small. And we usually only get about five records a year of these, but this year we think we've had about 10 records now. So they're having quite a good year. Um, and the bottom right is a small magpie moth. Um, they're just absolutely stunning. I think um, one of my favourites with that really yellowy thorax and they've got this kind of mottled black pattern on the wings and they're really small. Uh, but once you get your eye in, there's quite a lot of them around too. They're quite common. Oh, again, my, my names have gone, which is annoying. Um, so this group of moths is called the hawk moths um, and they're the biggest of all the moths. The one on the left is a poplar hawk moth. Um, and they're fairly common and um, their food plants willow. So we get them quite a lot here on the calf and um, they are nocturnal. So we catch them in our light traps. We actually had two we caught today, which are fantastic. Um, and, but they'll sit wherever we place them. So we've put two outside on the branch and they'll just sit on the branch until, um, it, till nightfall basically before they fly off. So they're quite tame. As you can see, I've got two on my face on the top right there. <laughs> it's a bit of a poster shoot. Yeah. Um, so the one in the middle and the top and the bottom there is called a hummingbird hawk moth. Um, so they are day flying moths and they have this really long proboscis, which you can see in the photo, and they drink nectar from really long flowers such as buddleia. And we generally only see them around the observatory because that's where we find the buddleia and fuchsia. 
Um, they also have incredibly fast beating wings, as the name suggests. It creates this humming sound like a hummingbird. Um, and in the bottom right here, we have a convolvulus hawk moth, which is the largest hawk moth. Um, it's a particularly dull specimen, have to say. It was very tatty. It's not its usual, impressive, vibrant self. Um, are usually really bright, smart looking moths. Um, but unfortunately, when we spotted this one, it was actually caught in one of the mist nets by the pond. Um, so that was a new challenge for Aaron who managed to rescue and release it. Um, and that was the sixth record for the calf. So that was a really good find. Oh, I've got a great video here of hummingbird hawk moth in flight, I wanted to show you. So you can see how fast their wings beat when it comes around in a minute. And um, they mimic hummingbirds, which we don't actually have in Europe. So this is obviously the closest we can get. And they fly at 12 mile per hour with 70 beats, wing beats per second, which is amazing. And they migrate from Southern Europe in the summer. We've had a maximum of seven in 2019. So they're not overly common, but they are really amazing moths. Um, so another thing we do is um, we do a butterfly transect, which we've been running since 1996. It's split up into five sections across the island. We try and break it up so it covers an assortment of different habitats. Um, it goes via a pond, so we cover Russia's wetland area, it goes through bracken and heath, it goes along grass fields, and it also goes around the observatory where we've got our non-natives like fuchsia and buddleia, and it's about two kilometres long. So we try and do this once a week whenever the weather is best for that week. Um, about midday. Um, and common food plants we have on the calf for butterflies include thrift, thistles, cookie flower, violets, um, and nettles. And there's not a massive variation, but I don't know why my butterflies have gone for this slide. That's weird. Mm. That's very weird. Um, there should be lots of photos of butterflies, unfortunately. There's only green veined white. Um, I'll just talk because most of you probably know these species, they're just the common ones. Um, but we actually have 17 of the 19 total species that we get on the Isle of Man. So compared to moths, butterflies, we have hard, I mean, in the UK, we have hardly any really. Just 19 species on the Isle of Man. And um, so the two we don't get here are common, uh, comma, sorry, and orange tip, um, which is interesting because their food plant is nettles, which, like I say, we do actually get these on the Isle of Man. Um, one butterfly we rarely see here, which is really common on the Isle of Man, is speckled wood which is our rarity, but um, obviously it's not here just because we don't have um, the right habitat. We don't have woodland habitat for them here. Uh, other calf rarities include small heath, grayling and gatekeeper. Um, and our most common butterflies at the minute are green veined white, which you can see it's the other one there, um, and dark green fritillary, um, which do really well here due to our abundance of thistles. I don't know where any of my slides have gone now. Um, should we go off and on again and see if that does anything? No. I just want to go through notes. Just show that last screen. Um, just what do you mean? Click escape. Yeah. And show it because you can see it. Okay. Can't map. Yeah. Just see that one. It just says a picture can't be displayed. <laughs> yeah, but we'll be able to see this one. Yeah. Okay. I apologize. Um hopefully you'll have to be able to see it in the bottom corner. Um so we get painted ladies every now and again. Um, the last time we had a large painted lady migration event, which was uh, 2019, and they migrate all the way from Northern Africa and the Sahara Desert, where the conditions um, aren't great and they're running out of nutrients and there's um, not enough water. They migrate all the way up to the UK, which is a total journey of 7,500 miles. So a really long way. And you get some really tatty ones that are in terrible condition after such a long flight. Um, and 2019 was an amazing year for them. But here um, it had a highest count in one transect of 307 painted ladies, uh, which is really impressive. And it shows the importance of doing these transects so we can monitor when these events happen. Um, and it's also interesting because it's telling us the conditions in um, 
the Sahara are all great as well because we're getting so many having to migrate all the way up to the UK, telling us that things are happening down there that are impacting the rest of the migration. Um, so one species that did well last year uh, was red admirals. When I was there in September, we counted 91 of them just in the observatory garden in one day. It was absolutely amazing, the most I've ever seen. Um, and Rob put out these bananas, they absolutely swarmed on them, which is a bit gross, but they are very beautiful. Um, and they love sugar and fermenting fruit, so you can actually use beer or wine to trap moths and butterflies. You can see it's effective. Um, and alongside the specific surveying and monitoring that we do for butterflies, moths, seals and birds, and we also record anything else that we see and can identify for the daily log. So beetles, slugs, jellyfish, literally anything we can get a good look at or a good photo of. Um, and these are some of the common beetles we see during the day and sometimes at night when we head out dazzling. Um, some of them are quite vibrant, such as the violet ground beetle, which has got this really purple shine to the edge of the thorax. Um, and we also have this the bronze beetle, which is a really metallic bronze uh, ridged back. I realize you can't really see it very well, but it's the top right, this bronze beetle. Um, so uh, we had the orchid beetle was a first record for the car for this year, which was uh, found by one of our volunteers. Um, but we think it might have been a ghost species, which means that it's been around for a while, but no one's actually identified it until now. It's still great to know when these, these things are around. Um, and minotaur beetles are quite interesting. And they're really common across the calf man. And um, they dig tunnels to nest in, and they can be up to 1.5 meters deep. Such a tiny insect. I just think that's crazy. Um, and you can spot their burrows are all perfectly round, about one centimeter, and they absolutely carpet the calf in these burrows um, during their, their peak season from July to September. Um, so the middle bottoms are green tiger beetles, which are also really vibrant, and they're the fastest, one of the fastest beetles in the UK. And we often count them when we're walking along tracks, they get startled by walkers and they fly further forward and land, which gives you time to kind of sneak up on them and check if it's a green tiger beetle. And once you get your eye in, they're quite obvious. And we also get some more challenging beetles to identify. Um, as you imagine a lot of beetles are quite similar looking. You get these plain black ones, um, but Medidas beetle has got these gorgeous bright red, leg, red legs, which help identify them. And so here are two plants that we have surveyed. The early marsh orchid, which was in decline in the UK, has done well in the calf in previous years. It's usually surveyed between May and July. Um, in previous years, we have had up to 50 plants. However, the past few years, we've actually started to see a really rapid decline of them on the calf. And we've had our lowest count ever this year of just 16 plants, which is pretty bad. Um, but on another note, um, this year we had Liz, um, come out of Liz Earl will come over and sorry that's okay <laughs> is it Liz Charter Liz Charter that's yeah. fine sorry uh, Liz Charter uh, come over and do a botany survey for the calf of man um, and she managed to locate round leaf sundew uh, which is the plant here on the right the bottom right and um, she's been record um, it's been recorded in the past, um, but not for several years, so it's quite an exciting find. Um, and this plant, despite being underwhelmingly small, is really spectacular looking. It has these really long red tendrils, which end in large drops of sticky dew, which traps insects. Um, and it's carnivorous, it digests anything that they catch in their trap. Um, they're usually found in harsh, acidic environments with little nutrients in the soil, which is why they've evolved to find nutrients from elsewhere. And we had a count of 62 plants. So it'd be really interesting to see how many we find in the future. And now we know where they are again. So um, last but not least, this is a common lizard and it's the only reptile we have on the carpet ban. Um, not much is known about their population at all, um, but they're regularly seen throughout the summer period. We've seen a maximum of 15 individuals in one day and we get an average of about 100 sightings throughout the season. So it suggests they're here in fairly high numbers. Um, something interesting about these animals is they're known as viviparous, meaning they incubate their eggs internally and they give birth to live young. And they also shed their tails when threatened and then regrow them later. So thank you very much for listening. I um, hope you've enjoyed our talk and that you've learned something new about the calf of man or wildlife and um, what we get here and what we do. I'm happy to answer any questions at all. I think there's a few in the chat.
Um, wow, uh, fantastic. Well done, guys. That was really, really interesting. Um, yeah, so if anyone's got any questions, please do stick your videos on and uh, I'll ask you to unmute if you've if you've got any questions. Um, I'll kick off if that's all right. Um, one thing that's always amazed me since uh, I joined Manx Wildlife Trust and started learning about the carp was the sheer numbers of, of birds that are caught on migration through the carp. Um, Rob, have you got an opinion as to why the calf records such great numbers of, of certain species? Um, I'm not really sure. It's, it's more of, um, it's a stop off um, through the Irish Sea. Um, it's the one place that birds can, as they're migrating, um, they can come and stop off, feed, rest, um, and then carry on um, through the journey. Okay, thanks very much. Um, uh, Chris, you had a, a question about fulmers. Do you want to unmute and, and put that to uh, to Rob? Yeah, you mentioned that fulmars are, are related to petrels, um, yes. but I thought fulmars were actually quoted as being related to albatross. They are related to albatross, that is true. Uh, well, they're... Um, no, they're related to storm petrels. They're, I think their nickname is the little albatross. Yes. Yes, I think that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but so they've got a name that says little albatross, but are they actually related to albatross? I think they're more closely related to storm petrels. Right. Okay. Well, they have the, the same uh, blowholes in their nose. That's right. They? Yeah. The yeah. tube nose. So they can like an albatross. Salt water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I did have a sneaky peek on uh, Wikipedia when you asked that question, Chris, and I think I, I'm not the the best expert on these things, but I think they're in the same overall group, but then the formals and petrels are in a subgroup, and I don't ask people to pronounce the, the scientific names of the groups. <laughs> so I think, yes, they are related, but not as related as, as storm petrels. Yeah, okay, right. Yeah. But if in doubt, <clears throat> have a look at Wikipedia, because that's always right, isn't it? <laughs> no, thank you for the question, Chris. Brilliant. Okay. Um, has anyone else got any questions that they that they want to uh, put to uh, either Rob or or Molly? Um, I just no, wanted to you. ask you, Molly. Actually, if um, uh, we started uh, the call today talking about the weather and how it's been quite dry and there might be a hosepipe ban uh, on the Isle of Man, and you mentioned that your water supply is obviously rainwater. So, mm -hmm. it, it, do you have a healthy supply of water, or or do you have to monitor that? Uh, oh no, we we actively monitor it. So we're limited to one shower each a week. Um, and as soon as the water starts to get low, it's kind of like everyone has to be really careful with what how many times they wash the dishes kind of thing. Um, we're currently actually on the backup well, which we have, which is supplied by groundwater, which um, I don't think they've used, well, they certainly haven't used before since Dan's been here, so three or four years. So it just shows how low, um, how bad the water situation is just generally at the minute. But it's yeah. it's actually been fine using that well. It's, it seemed to be topped up quite a lot. There's a lot of water being held in the ground. So we are doing all right, yeah. But it's difficult. Great, thank you. Okay, well, um, if nobody has uh, any other questions, um, speak now or, or forever hold your peace. I'll say uh, one final thank you very much. Uh, we can all do a, a nice muted uh, Zoom uh, round of applause. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us. And um, yeah, if uh, um, I hopefully look forward to uh, some of you joining us uh, on some of our other events. Uh, thanks very much, guys. Yeah, thank Just you very much. One final comment, if I may. Yes, yeah, please. I, I was there on the bird watching course in June, um, you may remember, uh, which was a thoroughly enjoyable three or four days. Really, really enjoyed it. The hospita hospitality there was fantastic. Um, you mentioned, Molly, that, that there's only one toilet, and that's a bit of a, a letdown, really. But we managed, <laughs> didn't we? Um, and I'm sure you do all the time. Um, but I think that you guys do an absolutely fantastic job. And thank you on behalf of everybody in the Isle of Man who appreciates what you guys do for us. Thank you oh, very much. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, yeah. yeah welcome. It's lovely. <laughs> thank you, Rob. Thank you, Molly. Cheers, guys. Bye, Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Graham. Thank you.